Thank you for tuning in to today's full episode of the Breaking Changes podcast. I'm your host and chief evangelist for Postman, Ken Lane. With Breaking Changes, we explore topics from the world of APIs, but through the lens of business and engineering leadership. Joining me today, we have Sabu Krishnan, architect for the technology strategy organization at Citrix. Sabu shared with me a very sobering view of what API governance looks like at a large enterprise organization, providing a blueprint that I'm going to be revisiting over and over for many months and years to come. I always start with the basics, start really simple. Who are you and, and what do you do? Uh, my name is Subhu. I work for the technology strategy office in Citrix. And as part of that, it, it's a horizontal organization which caters to the needs of all products and services. And my specific focus there is APIs. I mean, API infrastructure, API strategy, API design, best practices, anything to do with APIs, I like to get involved. So that's what I do. And I'm one of the people who founded the Citrix API platform when we started on the journey uh, in 2018. So that's me, Ken. So what, what started this journey? Why, why did you feel like it, it needed to happen? Oh, uh, I mean, we badly needed it, and I, I, we, uh, a lot of us also believed that we are actually already late, even when we started in 2018. So, uh, quite a few things we were seeing happen, uh, Kin. So, to name a few, one is that uh, we had different services and products, and each one did have APIs even at that point in time, but they all looked so very different from each other. So, there was nothing called consistency, and for an outsider, if they look at uh, two APIs coming from the same company, it wouldn't look the same. I mean, it would look like two different companies, right? And, and part of it, the reason is that the things happened organically, things happened in silos, things happened because of acquisition. So there are good reasons why it happened, but uh, net net, it was not a good idea to have that kind of, uh, uh, you know, what different view of the API uh, that Citrix had. So there was no consistency. And uh, to add to that, things like uh, even if somebody wants to look for documentation for APIs, there is there was no one way or one place to go. So some teams had PDF documents, some had uh, HTML documents, some had zip files which, which you could download from the product documentation, and and some had uh, you know what curl commands embedded within the product documentation. So it was I mean totally all different ways of doing things and and. Uh, when it comes to the experience of the consumer, it was very inconsistent and, uh, if I may say, a little bit uh, you know, what, friction, uh, frictional and, and painful also. So that is the other thing we wanted to fix in terms of how do you go and look for documentation in a standard and a consistent way. So documentation. And uh, to add to that, uh, in, in terms of security, uh, what you could do with when you have an API gateway in place, what you could do when you have policies to you know what rate limit so that your backend doesn't get uh, over flooded with requests all that good stuff that we want to have but uh, we had not taken any concrete action to make those things happen so in 2018 we felt that it's high time that we do something about it and that's how we got started on the journey so you you speak of consistency it's not just consistency in the design of the api it's consistency in delivery and operation of the api absolutely and 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 consistency in the experience of the consumer right it, it it's like I mean, it's a different world and experience. Like some of the documentation, uh, it, it's almost like throwing something, something, dumping something on the developer, right? So it's it, it's not you're catering to the needs of a consumer. You are showing them the needed respect, right? So we had all varieties. So not to say that people were not doing good APIs. There were some teams who were ahead of others, but you're absolutely right. So consistency in terms of where you look for it, how is your experience when you work with those APIs? Uh, all that thing uh, was not in place, and, and we wanted to, you know, what start fixing those things one by one. So I know in a large enterprise, when you have everyone uh, evolving on their own journey in their silos separately, yeah. when you try to uh, put in place some sort of uh, governance um, <laughs> to try to dictate or or tell you know or help even help, you get a lot of pushback from people. So how? How did you go about getting everybody on the same page here? Uh, I mean, I mean, uh, you just know it, Ken. I mean, uh, uh, you said it absolutely right. That that was indeed our experience, and and uh, I mean, there were many learnings uh, along the way, and, and I do want to touch upon some of the key ones. One is we, I mean, de definitely learned that you know, we're trying to force things on others or push 
or trying to be on the pedestal up there somewhere saying that, you know what, we, a bunch of people know how to do APIs and the rest of you follow us. I mean, that doesn't work. And because we are talking with people who are very busy, we are talking with people who are very intelligent. So trying to, you know what, force or, or you know what, uh, uh, dictate things doesn't work. And, and we did have, a, I mean, we tried various approaches and, and that's not something which works. Uh, what we found really works is, uh, you know what, being there in the attitude of someone there to serve them, to help them, to help them do things right the right way so that they reap the full benefits of the APIs the teams are building, right? So that mindset it itself had to shift from, you know what, uh, up there somewhere dictating to somebody who's your partner, who's your ally. So that helps. And, and also, as we moved along the journey, we realized that if somebody doesn't want to do, you don't stop there and say that, you know what, they are not interested. No, you try to dig deep what is stopping them. And, and when we did the, those exercises of trying to find out what is preventing, I mean, we are not telling something wrong, but what is something which uh, is stopping them, then we had a lot of learning. So one of the very first learnings we had is that uh, something similar which was attempted uh, some time back that didn't go through very well. And, and one of the reasons was that was that it was not an all inclusive approach so when we did the uh, you know what api guidelines and uh, you know what started drafting it we took people along and what i mean by that is we you know what so called uh, uh, enrolled or recruited uh, architects from each of the services so at least minimum one person and somebody who's respected within that team so they were a part of what we call the api virtual team and we a group of architects together you know what discussed and debated on the guidelines and and Together, we committed and signed on it and agreed to it that, okay, this is what looks like good guidelines for us as Citrix. And you know what? We commit ourselves to follow it. And when you have that kind of a buy-in, even though initially it takes a lot of time to you know have all those discussions, debates, arguments, and back and forths, and redraftings, all that, you are actually pushing it left, which is in a way good because that it's good to happen in the beginning rather than uh, late in the game, right? Because then making changes means everybody gets affected. So taking people along right at the very beginning, that helped us. And the other, some of the challenges we found is that what happened is we went, took a very prescriptive approach. So it, it's a huge document uh, having so many sections. And, and we, by the way, were inspired by a lot of good guidelines that other companies have created and, and been generous enough to publish it out there. So we took our inspiration and gave due credit to the inspiration wherever we took it. So what the other thing we realized is that it's quite a lot. And, uh, and if I remember correctly, there was on 250 odd must have guidelines. So we were following the RFC format and there were a lot of must haves. We have should haves and may have. So nobody even cared to look at the should and may because the must itself was quite a big list. And people said, this is too much for us to, you know, what comply with. And, and we don't have that kind of time and bandwidth and, and, and all those kind of challenges, right? So uh, very quickly, again, we realized is that number one, trying to do things manually, it's not going to work at all. So initially we tried doing Excel sheets and, you know, what marking with a yes, no, all that stuff doesn't work and very painful. And if you redo things, you have to start all over again. So we realized that we need some kind of an automation to, you know, what automate whatever can be automated. And unfortunately, in those days, we didn't have uh, what we can do with Spectral today. So we ended up building our own homegrown validation service. So that's again exposed as an API as well as, as a GUI. So you can, you know, upload your uh, open API or swagger and, and get feedback at least based on the statical uh, analysis of uh, uh, the uh, uh, specification. Uh, so that definitely helped because that, you know what, reduced the pain point and friction for people, for people who wanted to do the guidelines, but we were, were finding it difficult to manually navigate that. And the other thing, I mean, finally, I would like to say uh, a couple of things is that one, we started this Slack channel where people could, you know what, go to get support or get clarification or guidance on why some guideline is like that. Because we try to write everything, but still there is historical context which cannot be always written down, right? So sometimes people want to do it, but they want to be sure, like, why did somebody, is it a typo by any chance or, or did they, I mean, oversee something? So it helps when there are people who can answer and, you know what, provide guidance, provide support and be there for them. Them. And even that needs to be scaled. So we again realize that a small number of people can't do it. So we look for people who are very passionate about the whole thing. So we you know, uh, help, took their help to champion the cause of uh, doing the API design right and, and also being there to help others. So that attitude of helping others and being available, that really helped us a lot in, in our journey. And as I said, that Slack channel and, and the validation tool and, and a place where people can not interact and, and get guidance that uh, helped us a lot as far as the, the guidelines and governance uh, processes was concerned. Yeah, it's it's a very familiar journey I'm hearing from a lot of other enterprises. So 
and they're they're at various stages of that same same evolution and 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 realizing how hard this is yep. and how much work and how automation is pretty key but one of the things i get a lot of enterprise folks ask telling me is is well how can we just put uh, all of those rules in in the gateway or block it from going into the portal and making it so well people just can't ever publish and i'm trying to help them explain like that's not really a good idea you're probably gonna you know have more problems so what what balance did you are you seeing do you do you enforce it at the portal at the catalog level do you you know enforce you know uh, educate at the design level how are you finding balance uh, i mean very spot on observation kin and uh, i mean we also uh, if i may say we also tried that approach you know what we are the guardians and customers audience of the infrastructure so guys unless you follow every single thing we say we are not letting you uh, on board the gateway or portal and you know what happened people said okay we don't we don't even want to be on board like so uh, you know what again that that forceful approach that trying to impose things on others when they are not bought in or when they have other genuine concerns we realized quickly that that doesn't help and more than that it actually starts hurting so uh, we were in a situation where there was no adoption happening and and you tell me like what good is a platform a portal or a, a gateway when there's nobody onboarded on there right so very quickly we had to you know what learn our lesson and correct ourselves and you know what say that you no know, this is not the approach which is going to work that you know what uh, you prove your worth so to say and then we'll allow that's not the way uh, here i mean we are their partners right and, and and there is some good stuff good capabilities available when they are onboarded on the portal and and, and on the gateway so we have to encourage and support people so i mean we took a slightly lenient stance wherein we said you know what we're not going to block you we are going to encourage you to comply as much as you can help you support you and, and figure out like what's your genuine concern and how we can address it and in many cases you know what it was okay to give an exception i mean for, for example there are legacy apis you cannot go and change everything uh from scratch right that that takes too much of an effort and and see api is one more thing people are doing so we have to also understand that they are in product development and there are other customer requirements which may not be api related right so there are many things which are uh, pulling people in different directions and and trying to you know what make them do everything that you want to do that i mean that doesn't work that bargain doesn't work so we you know what realize that we have to strike the middle path the middle ground if if we all want to be win win and successful and that you know started working for us because then we realized that okay maybe there are a few which are maybe non negotiable when it comes to security when it comes to the way you do auth and certain other things but not every single thing has to be you know forced down their throat so here is the prescriptive guidelines so if you want to read it in detail and comply with everything you are free to and that's what we encourage you but if you feel that you know what that's not worth your time or or you want to strike a balance so that you go out there rather than doing your apis for six, next 6 months or 1 year to get, get it 100% compliant even we agree that it's important to put things out there rather than you know what keep beautifying it right so that what we again learned and and what work this try, trying to look for that middle ground and and again being a an ally here rather than trying to be custodians of the infrastructure that, that didn't work for us yeah yeah no it's a, it's an important balance and i see yeah. each company is a little different in the culture depending on if they're um you know more more developer led more it led more business led there's or or a mix of that you you get different cultures who are willing to do uh different things but people are smart people are opinionated people are busy yeah. doing their jobs and yeah. you can't always just tell them what to do <laughs> and maybe they actually know better and your guidelines are wrong yeah. and you should yeah. update your guidelines yeah. absolutely it, it happened just two days back uh, the day before yesterday or something when somebody pointed out a uh, actual contradiction so in two different sections two different things uh, were written and and when he pointed out i started uh, wondering and i and you know what the first thing i said is thank you for bringing this to my attention i mean so it's not that i know it all i stand corrected i mean when i mean, say i i mean all the people who looked at it and and, and that was not a, you know what a deliberate mistake it's just that two different sections we talk about the same thing in, in different languages or uh, you know different interpretations and that ends up being contradictory when you put them side by side right so that's exactly what this person did and then i said you know what in this case uh, a supersedes uh, guidance a supersedes the guidance b uh, because that's how the http protocol wants it to be so uh, you are absolutely right uh, people are smart people sometimes know more than what you know so uh, i mean you have to be their friend and sometimes you need to even get corrected based on the inputs they give and then which is why one of the other things we also did is that we didn't you know what freeze the guidelines saying that this is written in stone and now nobody can shall ever question it instead of we said this is also a re repo like any other repo 
feel free to submit your PRs. In fact, we, all, we don't have that much bandwidth in any case. So uh, instead of making us draft the changes, why don't you create PRs and submit and then we'll review and, and merge. So again, and there are people who have contributed to that and, and, and you want meaningful and valuable contributions. So uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, you win to the extent you take people along. I mean, if I have to summarize in a sentence, that's what it would be. Yeah, getting people's buy-in and having them be yeah. part of the process and see they can yeah. make changes is part of that. And yeah. and APIs are hard to see, and 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 guidelines are hard to see applied to your API, especially when you have two, three, four hundred, you know, of these rules that you have to do. But one of the ways that we make APIs more visible and able to see, or it is is the product catalog or the or the portal or the 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 gateway. All this. This convergence is where a, a, a lot of the APIs become real. They become tangible for both producer and consumer. So talk me through like how you approached your, your portal strategy. Uh, I mean, uh, again, a very valid point, and you're absolutely right. I mean, unless guidelines is fine, uh, I mean, to implement, but then at the end product has to be visible to the end user, right? So, and then that's where portal helps. I mean, all that discovery, the catalog, where you go look for it. And, and I mean, there was no doubts in our mind that we needed one. Uh, for, for sure, we needed one. In fact, we, we also wanted to do some kind of ca uh, consolidation because what was happening, as I was saying in the beginning, is that there were, you know, documentation all over the place and, and in different ways and forms, right? So we had to look at one place where not just you list the APIs and have these APIs properly and consistently documented, but which can be the, you know, what home landing page from where you get guided to the other documentation, which could be links from here or, or uh, 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 which may not be directly REST APIs, could be an SDK, could be some other form of an API, but at least you start from here and then you reach wherever you want to reach. So we did want to have one starting point. And, and uh, when it comes to a portal, again, it was a learning because our initial thought was, okay, let's go and take the first best thing and, you know, what, create the portal. And then we were successful. I mean, we were able to, you know, what, have that portal. And, uh, but again, very quickly, the learning started coming in. And uh, some of the key learnings we had is that one, uh, what we had taken was something which was coming from a vendor and, and that had, that helped us get, get started quickly. But that really cut our wings when it comes to, you know, what, customization and, you know, what, flexibility. Uh, because we are a big enterprise. We have a lot, a lot of stuff that we want to put there. And, and we have our, our own creative ideas also, right? And none of which could be accommodated in that portal. So very quickly, we had to start thinking about V2 of the portal. So we chucked that third, uh, I mean, third party vendor based one to, you know what, create a homegrown portal. But I'm still glad that we started somewhere because unless you start somewhere, you the learning doesn't happen, right? So if you keep debating on PPTs and meetings, I mean, it's just more meeting minutes and uh, drafts and documents, right? But when you create something and put it out there and people can look at it, play with it, then real feedback starts coming. So I mean, you can call it an MVP of sorts, even for the developer portal. So uh, I'm glad that we made a mistake and because that helped us learn and we quickly corrected ourselves. And uh, again, some of the key learnings there with respect to portal is that you want it to be something which is customizable and, and flexible, right? And I'm not saying that you have to always write it from scratch. There are vendors who provide you that kind of flexibility. I'm talking of an era like which is 2018 where we didn't have that kind of flexibility. So that is something you want to keep in mind. You don't want to get straight jacketed into something which doesn't let, let you move left or right, right? So you want a little bit flexibility. So uh, uh, for us, creating, I mean, writing it from scratch helped. Uh, self serviceability is absolutely important because again, the other mistake we had initially made is that we had the central team and bunch of developers and you be told people that, oh, you want to get your document published? Okay, mail it to me or send it to me or put it here. I'll, we'll take it and upload it. And that's how you're initially doing and that doesn't scale. And, and then uh, when people are making constant changes and corrections, uh, that cycle time increases, it frustrates the people because people who are doing the job of updating because it's very repetitive and boring. So we again realized that this is not something which works. We want something which is self-serviceable. So uh, when we were designing our own homegrown portal, we made sure that it is something which is as simple as, you know what, checking certain files in, in a certain format into a JIT repo. And then there's a way to, you know what, create a developer <coughs> uh, uh, version of the portal where you can actually see your changes play around with it without uh, touching the actual production. So you could do whatever you are doing, check in and keep making changes and keep, you know, what seeing how beautiful and how perfect it looks or, or whatever you need to do. And only when you're satisfied, you know what, you merge the PR into the other uh, branches and, and there on the CICD kicks in and takes it forward, right? So we made it extremely self-serviceable, except for some checks we, we put in place just to make sure that people don't by mistake publish something which is not supposed to be there, right? So I mean, there were minimal checks and balances, but it was nowhere close to the manual work which was happening initially in terms of collecting all the files and putting it there. So that was the second 
key learning that it has to be self serviceable enable people and and not you would rather spend your time creating tutorials and videos on how to onboard rather than collecting files from people to personally go and update or have your team do that so self serviceability and uh, 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 the other thing which we also found is that initially there was you know a resistance and you know what initial one or two people it was hard to get there but once people onboarded and when they saw that final portal and how the documentation looks there the free, the experience of it the consistency of it the ability to try the ability to download a swagger i mean so many things which you were not able to do before because you were not following certain uh, uh, practices and principles and and using certain capabilities now all that was you know what at, at, at arm's length i mean they didn't have to invest any time other than creating the open api spec which anyway they need to do if they are doing a good api and and some markdown so we, we didn't restrict ourselves to only open api because there is something you can document there some things you can't i mean for example you want to in explaining your api you want to put a diagram or a link to a video i mean you can't put it in the open api so we made it a little bit flexible saying that okay open api is the actual specification but you know what you might need some surrounding things which make the whole experience complete and uh, puts things in context so here is an opportunity for you to create markdown files put whatever you want the diagrams and text and and make it bold and make it italics or do whatever change the font size do whatever you want and you know what the cicd will pick it up and and it will show up nicely on the portal and again that again i feel really helped us because when you look at the final documentation it it looks complete it looks consistent it, it, which creates a good experience so uh, portal again uh, journey and again it's an ongoing journey like we are not done i mean more to do but still proud of where we were and and and, and uh, the distance we have covered so far so why do you why do you do this why are you so so obsessed with apis and making this change and and being on this journey because it doesn't sound easy oh uh, i mean that that is something even i asked that okay see uh, as a technologist i mean i've been in the industry for 20 years but some things naturally call me to it and some things don't right some things i have to do some things i love doing so i don't know why but i have always uh, i mean ever since i you know what got associated with apis or got interested in apis uh, there was no looking back for me and, and citrix is my actually second stint when it comes to apis even before citrix i was with ibm and uh, uh, there uh, towards the last one and a half two years we were building a cloud native service which was all about cloud integration so creating rest apis for uh, doing you know what operations on a system of record could it could be a salesforce it could be people soft whatever so uh, there the abstraction was a connector and and the most beautiful thing about connector is that it exposed rest apis it consumed apis and the whole life cycle of a connector was through apis so day in and day out we were doing only apis and and i loved that whole experience and and then uh, i mean i have thought like why this appeals to me so much but uh, uh, and probably the closest i could come to it is that for me api is something which allows you know what value to flow and and to the extent you enable value to flow it, it does overall good and to the extent you block value keep it to yourself or keep it in a silo or keep it locked up somewhere you are you know what you are you, you, you are minimizing the impact that you can create so for me what api you know philosophically means is an abstraction which allows value to flow freely of course you can put your checks and balances uh, maybe somebody might want to monetize nothing wrong in that but unless you have the abstraction which allows value to flow uh, you are you are restricted right and, and and again that also curtails creativity so i feel passionate about apis probably because if you do it right and and you have the right thought process and attitude and you know what work towards it you see a lot of value flowing and and the, the then the innovation that happens around it then the impact that happens around it that you know what it means a lot to a business it means a lot to me as a technologist when i uh, i mean i could build whatever tool uh, for example that validation tool i could have built but unless i make it available to others through whatever means and in this case it was an api and a gui so how will others use so if i want to make it available i better have apis and if i want the apis to be easily usable i have i better have good apis so I and mean, that has been my thinking and you are right i mean it's it's not easy, easy thing in fact i i do wonder how do you i mean technology is one part but how do you you know what share this passion and love for i mean my something which bothers me is like how do you make others love api at least part of how much i love i mean how do i share the love for apis with others and making them feel about it the same way and this could be a developer this could be a product manager this could be even the c, c level executive and, and and i mean i don't have uh, an ultimate answers to that kin and if you know you should probably let me know because that will definitely help me but i i do feel that if people love apis if people genuinely understand what an api does for them and what it can do for the business the way they approach it the way they invest in it the way they you know what leverage it will be very different from a mindset where 
two or three or some odd number of people are trying to force things down other people uh, that that doesn't work i mean you have to know it you have to love it that's when things happen the right way that i mean that's my belief or and my experience so far yeah well i don't have the answers either <laughs> that's actually what this show is for is to try to figure out the answers and you're all supposed to be bringing me the answers and then i'll 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 get all the credit and being the person who who ends up knowing and giving it i mean from what I'm seeing, the conversations on this show, uh, which I've had quite a few since January, um, I think we're, I don't have to do the latest count, I think we're around 50, 60 conversations I've had. The one theme that I'm seeing is, uh, is, is that gets people in, in caring about APIs is, is they've got, they've got to be successful in what they're doing. And there, that means it's got to have alignment between uh, business goals, what the consumer needs, the, the user of the APIs, yeah. and then what the developers want. And there has to be a balance between that. And that's what um, API product managers, I, I see a lot of product managers evolving and iterating because they're really working to be that bridge. They respect and care about developers yeah. And, yeah. and acknowledge that developers and, and IT have a lot of power and a lot of knowledge and understanding. Um, but then the consumer also needs certain things. And then we all, there has to be that business alignment. And so that's where I see things. The, 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 the big next iteration of what's happening here is, is product managers involved in that conversation. And it changes the tone of the conversation that I see in IT groups. Yeah. I mean, that was again spot on. And I mean, there's a very, you know what, a very insightful points that you shared. Ken, and that has been my observation too. I mean, to the extent that I have observed, and, and I'm not talking one particular company, I mean, based on my conversations with a bunch of people across the board. Uh, I mean, one very good way to figure out where somebody is in their API journey, uh, I mean, their maturity level is, is talk to product managers. So if you ask a product manager, do you know what APIs you have? And if they don't even know, that tells you like they're not even started on that, right? Uh, and if they say, okay, it might be there somewhere in the documentation that, that, I mean, that's the bad, I mean, lowest of the low levels, right? Whereas somebody, if they say that, by the way, like, uh, uh, okay, let me come step by step. So the next level could be somebody who says, oh yeah, we invest in APIs and we have, we follow the guidelines and then, you know what, we onboard onto the portal and uh, this and that. So again, it's like, okay, some bare minimum thing they are doing to just make sure that at least it's designed properly and all that. But. You know, the real catch is, the, in my opinion, the higher or the highest level of maturity is like one when you actually have API product managers. I mean, that's one very good way of knowing how, how a company is invested into APIs. In fact, when anybody approaches me or tries to talk to me, I try to figure out like, do they even have a role for an API product manager? Because if they don't, then it, it tells me from the business side, there is not that much focus and interest. It's just a technical game that they are playing, which has nothing bad in itself. But again, I call it intermediate level of maturity. Whereas if you have API product managers and, and, and when an API product manager talks, and if they talk about API roadmap, and if the word API gets them excited, they talk about use cases, they talk about, I mean, the addressable market and, and what kind of things customers are building and, and how they're going to enable that and start talking about monetization. I mean, take it from me for sure that that, that organization is deeply invested in APIs. I mean, that's my way of, I mean, that's my thermometer to figure out like how far somebody has gone uh, in, in the journey. And, and that, that's how even I tend to look at, like even in my own organization, like how we are maturing, right? So at, at one point, nobody was talking monetization, nobody was talking, you know what api is for use cases api first api product i mean at the max it was like okay let's talk guidelines governance and infra but then now i slowly see things changing and product managers are beginning to talk about it and and, and that if you ask me it's a very good sign and a very healthy and a very welcome sign and and, and you are absolutely right until the business is supporting you till the product managers are your allies and, and they are actively you know driving it from the forefront it's very hard to, you know, what just a bunch of technologists to get together and, and you know, get the API program right. I mean, I, I don't know of too many cases who have done that right. And uh, one more point, if I may, if I may add here again, uh, when, when, I mean, when I asked you that question of how do how do you get people love APIs and you know what get them really excited about it and encourage them, one of the learnings again we had along in our journey is that, you know what tell people the value and, and in a way that they can understand. So again, it is one thing to tell them that, okay, here is the onboarding document, go onboard onto the portal or onboard onto the gateway. Okay, they will ask you, why should I do that? What benefit? I mean, anyways, people are using what, what benefit? So, but when you, you know what, shift the conversation around the benefits they will get. So I can give a few examples. So one is that you can talk about, you know what, okay, today, how are you securing your API against a DDoS attack? 
okay what will happen if somebody tries to you know what uh, 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 bring down your api intentionally or unintentionally uh, what kind of protections you are building and if you are building it how repetitive and how much resources you are investing on that but you know what here is some welcome information for you that if you onboard onto the gateway this entire infrastructure has an ingress it has a uh, waf in front of it it has a ddos protection so just by having your api there you get all of this for free i mean you don't have to spend one more dollar of development or test effort right it, it's there for you so you know what when you start talking in that language for how what benefit they get and for for what cost or no cost uh, that gets people excited the other conversation which has worked for us is talking around analytics so we may ask them do you know how many api calls are coming into you? i mean do you know which is the most used api like do you know what's the average response time and people don't know the answer but then when you show them the portal uh, sorry the dashboard for the api analytics and show them all those numbers you said you know what the people who are getting these numbers they didn't have to write any analytics code or you know what create their own splunk or anything they just onboarded and just by onboarding on the gateway these metrics start getting populated automatically i mean that's how easy it is and you know what then again people start getting interested so one thing we realize is that you talk value value for them how it's going to help them people get very excited and and in fact we have seen that change in terms of adoption also at one point we were chasing around people asking them to onboard their apis on the portal and gateway and there has been times when we had to turn down people or, or ask them to wait and put them on a waiting list because we wanted to be doubly sure about the capacity that we have we don't we didn't want to have an api which is you know what coming and consuming a lot of uh, the capacity we have and then thereby starving others right so we wanted to deliberately do it so even though it's self service so and that was again a very welcome change to see wherein from a place of you know what asking people from to a place where you tell them you wait for some time uh, we see that you want to get the value but let let us do it the right way so that others because it's a multi tenant thing let's let's not uh, disturb others and and uh, roll it, roll it out in a way so that uh, everybody everybody benefits without anybody getting disrupted so talking value in in real concrete terms is again something we felt that it does help when you talk to people and try to you know what influence them to do uh, the right things and the right way yeah no that's i would say that's consistent with what i hear with other conversations is is that value exchange if you focus on that and the and the other part i heard you say is is enabling people to focus on what on the value creation so they're not spending their time <laughs> building out another analytic system or another yep. firewall or becoming security experts they're yep. able to just focus on the thing the value the business value that matters to them and makes their life easier and Absolutely. and that enablement and that's that's the co other consistent theme I, i'm hearing is governance is something we talk about at the higher levels at, at center of excellence is no one cares about governance and operations they just want to be enabled to do the right thing and not make yeah. mistakes and yeah. so you have governance is just about enablement but i'm i'm really curious you mentioned it in there a couple times is what is your definition of api first what does it mean to you uh the honest answer is there's no one definition can i mean there are i would look at it like that the famous story of a blind man looking at an elephant and somebody catches hold of the tail somebody catches the trunk and they're all right in their own way but none of that is complete so few thoughts which come to me when uh, i mean when i hear api first is the first word is like treating apis as first class citizens and and what that means is directly what i was talking to you about like showing it the love that you would show the other parts of the system or the other things that you develop right so not treating it like a by product or uh, you know an afterthought or something uh, an, an addendum or all that stuff like that is what is not as api first that is treating it as first class kit citizens when it comes to support when it comes to you know what quality attention and investment that is one way i i qualify something as api first the second thing uh, when it comes uh, what comes to my mind is Uh, again again uh, sharing real examples i have seen cases okay I, 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 without quoting organizations or teams where you know what people do the development and then after post the development there will be some annotations in the code and then they'll run a tool and that'll spit out an open api spec and then they say okay this is our api right so i say no that is not api first that is api last i mean you did everything that needs to be done you did the implementation and now you are telling me this is uh, my API first is not same as having an, an open API spec or a swagger, right? It, it's like when you think about the uh, design and interface first, and and then and get feedback on it from all the relevant stakeholders, and then get uh, buy-in, and and then you know what, uh, agree to it, commit to it, and you know what, lock it in a, in some sense, and then start the implementation. That is API first. So when you pay attention to the interface first, that is again API first for me, and and doing it the right way. So doing it the way it needs to be done. So which is again same as. 
treating it as first class citizens whether from the producer standpoint or from the consumer standpoint so that is the other uh, uh, you know what uh, interpretation i have of a api first and the third one which again i, I use it once in a while is and, and again i have seen that in practice uh, not a lot but quite a lot of people who are aware of it is uh, people who have this mindset that you know what I don't care about the GUI first. So I mean I am not going to spend all my time trying to build GUIs before I go out and deliver my capability, right? So I'm going to go out with my API first. So and yeah, some of it, some of the capabilities might be there in the GUI, but not all of it because that's too much time for me to get feedback. So I'm going to go out with my API first. So my first delivery will be in terms of the API. GUI might be along with it or might come later or might never come also for that matter because we get, we have we have seen cases where Consumers don't want to use your GUI, so they, they don't care about their GUI for whatever reason. They want to integrate the capability into their portal or they want to maybe just write a bash script and, and or a Python script and, and not use GUI at all. So all those cases, right? So the third uh, way I would, you know what, call out API first is when you, you know what, you go out, you, 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 you know what, you get into the uh, field with your APIs first, then your GUI or then your documentation or whatnot. So that's a third way I interpret. I mean, there's no one way, as I said, but I have seen all these things. And, and for me, it's, it's, it's a beautiful combination of all these aspects that, that qualifies as API first. I like that. It's flexible. It's pragmatic. It's, it's, uh, it's prioritizing the things that matter. It makes a lot of sense. Well, I really, I really love your view of things, and I, and I'm always, always love chatting with you. Um, I look forward to the next time we get to hang out in person because it's been a while. Um, yeah. But I, I really appreciate you coming by today and sharing your journey. Absolutely, thanks for having me, and it's such a complete pleasure to talk to you, Ken. And, and I know I can't end the call without saying a few things. So number one is like, thank you to people like you. I mean, because I mean, I, I didn't know anything about APIs when I started on my journey. I mean, I think it was 2014 or uh, around that time frame. And and it was people like you, people like Mike, Amundsen, Eric Wilde. I mean, you guys are, you know what? From the front, you are leading the charge, and also, you know, generously sharing your knowledge and and you know, connecting people and putting out thoughts, putting out wisdom putting out learnings. So, so if I'm able to contribute even a little bit, it's a lot of it has actually come from you and people like you. So really grateful and thankful to all of you for, you know what, being there as somebody whom we can look up to and learn from and, and get inspired by. So that's one. And one more thing I, I, I will definitely say is like, I absolutely love Postman. And I think I got, got started with Postman sometime again in 2015, around that time frame. And I just love it for the simple reason that it, it helps me get my job done, but more than that, I mean, there could be other tools which do that. But for me, there's this emotional connect with Postman because it helps me, you know, tell a story. And, and you know, I have blogged and posted about it, how, you know what, it in certain cases, it helped me uh, make an influence and, and make, a, you know what, a, get an agreement which was not happening otherwise. But by showing, you know what, a bunch of collection, how it how the APIs work, people really bought into the idea. So it, it helps me in storytelling. It's it not, I don't see it just like a tool to, you know what, make some calls. And likewise, any new API that I have to use, the first thing I try to look for is, is there a Postman collection? Because you know what, I know if I am able to find one, it's going to save me a lot of time. So I do spend quite a lot of time searching for a collection first. Only when I am sure that nobody has created this, uh, created it, or I don't have access to it, is when I you know what, break my head on the other stuff. But it it really saves me a lot of time. And finally, I mean, it's a lot of fun to work with Postman. So I mean, thank you for what you are doing at Postman. So uh, I mean, it is really helping uh, me and many others uh, who you know what use it on a day to day basis and and you know get work done and have fun along the way. So thank you for that. Well, it's good to hear. Thank you for the kind words. And and regarding information sharing and helping new, new people understand the space, I hate I hate to tell you, you're the you're the front line now too. That's what this show is about: is reaching new yeah. people, sharing, and and getting them aware of what what needs to happen. And and this show is very much creating that next generation of API product yeah. managers, designers, architects, and they're going to be learning from you. So now you're you're part of that front line as well. So thank you. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what we have learned. No, pass it on. So whatever I know, I'll be. I'm happy to you know what share with others. So again, learning again that also from you. Appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, Ken. Thanks for having me. It was a true pleasure talking to you. Thanks again to Sabu for stopping by. You can find more about him on LinkedIn and Citrix at citrix.com. You can subscribe to the Breaking Changes podcast at postman.com/events slash breaking dash changes. I'm your host, Ken Lane, and until next time, cheers. <laughs>